spread the fire. Welcome back to SMWX. And today, we've got an incredible interview lined up for you. Have you seen this book that everyone's talking about, Balance of Power, by renowned journalist Kanita Hunter? Why, you know, break the book down when you can just speak to the author? Thank so, you very much. I think I've been trying to get you on SMWX for like since SMWX started. Ah, thank you so much. And this book is a perfect excuse <laughs> Exactly. To when chat. I saw the book, I was like, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, we covered the election. Obviously, that's yes. when we started um, our work. And everywhere we went, we saw you. No matter rain, shine, light, dark, you're an incredibly hardworking journalist and it shows in this book. Can, before we get started, can you just take us through what it was like chronicling this book transition period between the Zuma moment and the Ramaphosa moment from the perspective of a journalist? So the thing is, right, uh, in journalism, there's, there's, there's people that I like to call like runners, right? And, and that's what I am, a runner, right? So <laughs> not running drugs, but <laughs> running the news in terms of always being on the ground um, mm. and always having the, the luxury, I think, to, to be out there and to be um, you know, in, in at times where even if it's no news to still be there and then even in the peaks when it's elections mm. should to be around. And I think that that was the format that my career kind of organically just went on, which now in retrospect helped me so much with this book because mm. things that seemed unrelated and, and conversations that seemed absurd five years ago, eight years ago, mm. um, sort of come back and say, oh, this is how it actually fits in a bigger picture. Right. Um, and that for me has been uh, invaluable when I look, when I think about, you know, the nights um, spent, uh, the late nights, you know, eight years ago, mm. uh, the frustration of, of working or having to, to kind of like fight your way into this into this journalistic space, having to 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 wait outside Kusatu House or, <laughs> or to, you know, yeah. cover the Mangaun conference without having a clue over mm. what's happening, that kind of thing. And 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 reflecting now to say that this actually was a a luxury and a privilege that has that has enriched me as a journalist, mm. but also enriched my work in so many ways. Yeah, absolutely. And and it shows with the book because there are a number of things that you're able to, you know, elucidate that maybe we don't have time for in the fast-paced news cycle or we can't always refer back to, but taking a bit of a step back, is it's a different journey. And I found that while I was reading it. Let's firstly just put some of the myths of what this book is yeah. aside because people always think they know what a book is about before they've actually read it, you know. And I think one of the myths about this book is it's some kind of biography of President Ramaphosa's life. What is, this, what is this book about? This book chronicles a transition in South Africa's recent history. That's all what it seeks to do. Mm. Mm. Um, and to appraise, appraise it analytically mm. and critically. And that's it. Yeah. So, so there are books that, that chronicle Sir Ramaphosa's life. There are books that talk about his, his, his politics, his business. And there are books about Jacob Zuma. They, they, that all exists. Mm. For me, what I felt was quite mi was 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 missing at this point in in in, in South Africa's um, political life mm. is is the stepping back of what did this period mean? So we're talking about the transition from the end of the Jacob Zuma years mm. to the beginning of the Cyril Ramaphosa years, because that is going to kind of define what the Ramaphosa administration means in the same way Absolutely. the Polokwane moment uh, in 2007 mm. meant for the beginning um, and for the Jacob Zuma years that mm. followed. Mm. So, so, so for me, that was absolutely important to say, okay, this is happening at lightning sp um, speed. And that's why we need to step back, okay, while still re you know, reporting and breaking news and all of that kind of thing, mm. to step back and say, okay, what are, what are some of the themes that, that people would want to know? So today, when we have ESCOM in the crisis that it is, yeah. we kind of understand, we kind of understand Ramaphosa's decision making or the type of people that influence his decision making mm. or these are the this is his kitchen cabinet. And for me that was more important because we kind of knew it with Jacob Zuma because yeah. of, you know, um what the Jacob Zuma years were. But but when it comes to Sir Ramaphosa, 
people had no idea these are the people that he seeks counsel from. Mm. Um, and I think that's absolutely important because, again, when you reflect on the Jacob Zuma years, and you saw, and this is just one tiny element, the Stalingrad uh, legal strategy sure. of Jacob Zuma, you knew Michael Halley. You know, it was mm. Michael mm. Halley, mm. Jacob Zuma, Stalingrad uh, uh, legal strategy. That mm. made sense. Mm. Now, when, when you know, things happen uh, in court, for example, who is giving Cyril Ramaphosa advice? Mm. Who is mm. this person? Um, and, and, and that's what I saw to kind of to, 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 to get to in a way that doesn't cr only chronicle things that we know, but also to go behind the scenes and mm. dig out things that may be obvious to me as a journalist, but not obvious to you or someone on the street, you know, reading this for the first time. Absolutely. And... While you're reading it, you can you can almost feel the power tipping, you know, from one era, which you go back into to the next, and you end at the start of, in many ways, this this new era. And the way you open, sorry for the spoilers, people, um, <laughs> is is really brilliant because you've got what becomes like the two centers are still one at, at the time. At, at the time, so take us through this opening scene of yours where. In fact, President Ramaphosa is actually a product of exactly. the Zuma faction of yeah, the ANC. Because yeah. that, that's like, that breaks a lot of the binaries that we work within often when we speak about the factions in the ANC, yeah. for example. Which is probably why we shouldn't be thinking as factions as absolute, as absolute because mm. things evolve and things morph in so many ways. Mm. And the reality of it is that Cyril Ramaphosa's return to active politics was engineered five years prior to, to the point of those same people opposing him to become president mm. and and literally taking you to a, a room where Ace Makoshule, which in today, when you read the news today, you would you would basically see Ramaphosa on one end and Makoshule, mm. you know, a black and white comparison, whatever you'd, you know, yeah, you'd yeah. want to, to, to contrast these factions. But at the time, the engineering of we need a deputy president for the Jacob Zuma slate. We mm. need someone who's credible, but not but not too credible that will pose a threat to, to, to Jacob Zuma, as the mission at the time was mm. was fighting uh, Khalima Mutlante and, and, and removing him as, 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 as a threat because he dared to challenge uh, Zuma in, in, um, in 2012. Mm. And so they bring this man back from politics. And little did they know that five years later, they would be opposing him as he now dared to contest mm. uh, the status quo of the of, of, of the Zuma arrangement um, in 2017. Yeah. yeah. So there are wonderful moments like that that you wouldn't have necessarily known if you're just following the news cycle. And you obviously got to speak to incredible people as you were going about the journey of this book. One of the interesting people you spoke to, which I haven't seen you asked about much, was the Chief Justice. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, you have this little moment where you get to interview him in the wake of Ramaphosa's and, and, and you kind of ask him this very candid question. Take us into what you ask the Chief Justice and the kind of response he gave after President Ramaphosa, you know, became uh, elected. So, the, the, I mean, in the course of this book, but just generally, I like yeah. to ask questions that I think about and, and somehow is a little awkward, mm. but, but, but sometimes it's fascinating to see the response. And before I get to, this, yeah. to the Chief Justice, you know, the, the time, I mean, and this was a long time ago that I asked Halima Mutlante this question mm. as to like, why did you contest Suma? Like, like you knew you were going to lose. Yeah. Why did you do it? And that was a fascinating thing for me. And so, so, so sitting with the Chief Justice... What did he say to that, by the way? And, and he said it was a principled decision mm. that he knew he was going to lose, that it was him proving a point that we need to do away with this arranged leadership mm. and, and, mm. and, and so that's what the step that he took. I mean, obviously, he frustrated so many of his supporters yeah. by being so non-committal and all of that kind of thing. And so I thought, let me ask you, mm. so why would you do it this way? And that was his rationale. Whether yeah. people agree with it or people doubt it or whatever, I just, it, sometimes mm. it's mm. important to, you know, even ask like Mbeki about... You know, what do you think of the nine ways to deal? You know, yeah. that, that, that it's awkward questions, mm. but sometimes it just it, it gives a perspective that you wouldn't necessarily have thought. So with the Chief Justice, yeah. for me, what was one of the m most important questions to mm. me was like, at the time of your appointment, you know, of the of yeah. the Zuma years. I mean, we'll get to the Ramaphosa bit. Mm, mm, mm. Was that you were the least qualified person for the job, right? And people obviously attacked the appointment. Yeah. And then, and I was like, what did you make of the situation? And he says something that I was like, you know, shocked to my core to say, mm. 
it probably was someone, meaning Jacob Zuma, appointing someone who didn't deserve the job because they thought mm. I could have been a lackey in, uh, at the apex court. Yeah. Um, and then obviously it didn't really turn out that way for, 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 for him. Mm. Um, and so that kind of realization or, or, or that type of frankness from the chief justice yeah. is, is like, oh, wow, you know. But, but then there are parts where the chief justice obviously comments on politics where, mm. Where, mm. where he talks about, you know, this thing of, you know, but, but you know, the Messiah concept of, 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 of one person can fix everything. Mm. Um, the concepts of, you know, him talking about like the slimming of the state, for example, um, something that Ramaphosa really, really uh, campaigned on, that I'm going yeah. to cut the executive. And, and that was the people were, were hungry for that type of mm. almost a superficial announcement. But that, sure. re- but that didn't even even that superficial yeah. uh, uh, um, kind of um, political move didn't play out mm. because Ramaphosa still kept the bloated executive. So, so, so I mean, for, for the, what, what I learned from the Chief Justice, the conversation I had with the Chief Justice, yeah. was the broader concept of the consequences of the years of, 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 of Jacob Zuma mm. was the appointment of people in positions so that they would be beholden to the establishment yeah. of, of, of that Zuma arrangement. Um, and then it, it, it found its ways in the Hawks and it found its mm. way in the criminal justice system. And to a large degree, um, uh, you know, uh, some people may even argue that Tuli Marunsela was almost like a beneficiary with the, of this, like the chief hmm. justice. Yeah. And yeah. they just happened to, when they have gotten, when they have when they got to their positions, realized that there's, you know, there's, there's, mm. there's the constitution, and there's something bigger than who they are, and this how they got to the job, yeah. um, and 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 for me, that's important now to kind of understand that that was the modus operandi then. Mm. But now when Sir Ramaphosa appoints his best friend from childhood as the head of the state security agency domestic branch, um, why aren't we putting those same questions to him? Mm. So we, 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 we can understand how how nepotism and, and, and you know, the, the Zupta, Gupta era, what yeah. it did to state entities. So now we need to be equipped with this information as yeah. we now go forward and say, oh, that appointment has been made. So how does this fit in? Mm. This is Ramaphosa appointing his friend. Why would you want to appoint your childhood friend as the head of the SSA? Uh, and then you kind of unravel of how the SSA was actually like a, became uh, Zuma's parent intelligence mm. agency of his back pocket as he fought his opponents. And effectively, it became a tool to, 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 to fight, from, uh, to fight uh, Jacob Zuma's own battles, or whatever those battles were yeah. as the years progress. But now that empowers us these way with, the, mm. with knowledge to say, okay, when the states... So, so there's a temptation for Ramaphosa to do the same because what's stopping him from appointing his friends um, to head the Hawks and appointing people who are... Uh, um, who are not independent mm. and compromised to certain positions. So this kind of uh, um, empowers us to say, okay, what does this mean? Or is this is this a repeat of mm. of of mm. of what we've seen? And we've seen the consequences of how that played out. So is this going to be a repeat of that? Yeah. And 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 for me, when we when we uh, discuss things like I, I know this is a bit kind of all over the place, mm. but I just I just feel, feel like free. it's more it's more um, you know to talk mm. about it in a more holistic way. Yeah. Like we you don't have to cut you off with ad breaks. So <laughs> thank <it's okay>. you <laughs> for IR. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but but um, so so when you when you see the appointment of uh, Andre Dureta, for example, mm-hmm. and you see Ramaphosa coming yeah. out and this saying this is the ESCOM the ESCOM CEO, CEO. Yeah, yeah, and and you see the president coming out and saying, uh, but we are committed to non racialism mm. and then in my book I kind of detail a different appointment when he was appointing a chief of staff and people was and, and, and political advisors mm. and people were saying to him hmm, your political advisors are white or or your campaign is run by white people uh, you know and, and people started drawing that kind of of, of um, concern about it mm. and his response was I believe sincerely in the concept of non-racialism mm. something that he didn't really believe in when he was in the unions met Mandela Mandela convinced him about it so for me those anecdotes of appointing a random chief of staff and, and mm. arguing that we, we must be firm in, in, in this concept of non-racialism and I don't have an issue between whether my political advisor is a white person or not, um, kind of then creates a consistency to follow to say it's not abnormal for Ramaphosa to defend this appointment because this sure. is his characteristic. You can see the narrative 
from before. All the, all the examples or sure. the pattern that has been followed, the sure. same way uh, in terms of how he, how he makes appointments, loyalty is a very big thing for him mm. because p he has brought people um, uh, into his inner circle, people who have literally been working for him when he was Secretary General at Shell House mm. in 1996. Mm. So, 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 you know, you see that sense of loyalty. So now yeah. when you see people, when you see... Um, uh, the Beng was visit Bengwa, sure. for example, appointed to a board of a, of an entity, mm. and people are like, "What?" And then you you realize it's also consistent to mm. who this mm. man is, um, and 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 it's not it's not something it's not something that's abnormal or something that's that's just Ramaphosa making a random decision. It's yeah. it's the same way uh, of him not being confrontational, of kind of maneuvering, and 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 people often talk about this long game and the long game, but I mean. Today, we can have a different discussion about maybe there's no game. <laughs> um, yeah, this but, long game is taking very long. <laughs> it's taking very long. Um, but, 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 but basically, um, understanding that, that things don't happen just out of the blue. Mm. Things don't happen mm -hmm. in isolation. And that's the, that's the trick of understanding politics is understanding, long, understanding and comparing to what sure, was. Sure. So, so, so when, for example... Um, when Jacob Zuma becomes president, he takes literally KZN and brings it to to, to mm. the union buildings, and 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 people were saying to me um, in different appointments. For example, there's a guy who was appointed as the head of VIP security. I mean, a irrelevant position, but yeah. I mean, this guy was with Ramaphosa back at Shanduka. Hmm. Um, some of the people. So, so 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 then someone says to me, you know, this is cadre deployed. Oh, this is important. This is what Zuma did it's just mm, it's mm. just like this version went to private school <laughs> you, you yeah, know what i mean because yeah. pe you can you can then justify Cater deployment with the twang yeah with the twang yeah. <laughs> so 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 and and that's what we saw in the in the appointment of cabinet as well mm, so mm. so for me you cannot discount these things mm, mm, you mm. cannot walk into a room and look at it on face value or and you see Ramaphosa appointing a cabinet and you're like oh, okay this is interesting mm, he mm. left out this person but he included this person there are things that are bigger than the announcement of today and you see the consequences much yeah. later. So, so can I ask you on that? We'll come back to the, to the narrative that you establish in this book, but looking forward, the president is about to give State of the Nation. I think it's fair to say that his previous addresses have come in the, in the context of a lot more hope, hmm. a lot more belief in him. Yeah. He had a lot more capital to work with. Whereas this speech comes at a time when people's patience is wearing a lot more thin than it has been in the past. What do you think will be going on, given your insights into you know, the, the presidency that he's building, will be going on behind the scenes as he prepares for the speech? I think that, that there, was, there, was, there was two mistakes made mm. of the millions of mistakes made. Is mm. Firstly, the... the, the, the you know, the, the wasting of this luxury that he had of this optimism, this ramaphoria. Sure. So he, he basically, uh, you know, uh, took it and ran with it, um, not realizing that people are going to want to expect some action, mm. right? Mm. Then, I mean, last year's State of the Nation, uh, the, the one about the dream and the, yes. and the city, and people are becoming increasingly frustrated. And you 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 cannot appease people the same way you could have appeased them, um, you know, some years ago by mm. saying, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, we're going to do this. Because the reality of it is, if you take his first State of the Nation address, the Tuma Mina, and I talk about the concept of how oh, Tuma Mina came oh, we're coming there, don't worry. <laughs> but, but, but if you take that and you, see, and, and, and you look at some of the promises he made at the time, a lot of it was fulfilled. So you talk about, you know... Um, uh, the the SARS inquiry, NPA, the turning around of, you know, so so so, so there was some sort of 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 development and mm. movement. Now come to his now officially first term as as sure, as, as sure. president, a lot of the the promises that he made have not been fulfilled. Mm. So for example, you make this you make this justification when you appoint this big executive that, okay, I'm appointing this big executive, but but I'm going to have KPIs for ministers. Mm. Wow, it's mm. revolutionary. You have a whole department called the Department of Performance, right. Monitoring and Evaluation that's, that's entire existence is to do that revolutionary thing that you announced, yeah. 
and it's been almost I don't know how many months since the election, and there's no ministers don't have agreements mm. on what the expectations are, and the reality of it now is that you, if you if you are competing with the fiscus that's dwindling, so you yeah. have no latitude to announce big projects and exciting things because there's no money to fund it. Number one, mm. number two is your party can't get together on one announcement that you made about the unbundling of ESCOM last oh, year, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then the third thing is that. Um, you you've made all of these promises and you haven't delivered on it. So what do you what do you have to work with now for this state of the nation address? Yeah. And the reality of it is that you just have to be creative with your words. <laughs> and, <laughs> and 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 literally that was Ramaphosa in the June after he became yeah. um, after yeah. the election. That was he just you had to be creative. Mm, you because mm. the reality of it is how. How are you going to fix the state-owned enterprises? You have no cash yeah, to fix state-owned yeah. enterprises. What you can do is make a bold announcement to say from 740 SOEs, we're going to cut it to 350. Only for a, a, a chacharach reporter called Conita Hunter <laughs> digging and finding out that actually there's no... Uh, there's no work done on that. There's no mm. research. There's no. You mm. understand. Mm. So, so, so we literally into this into this territory of 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 just uh, repackaging promises so that you can still grip on whatever optimism is left. Yeah. Because the reality of it is that the the state is so decayed. And I, and and you know the um, in the January eighth mm. um, mm. run up to the January eighth. That's what I really saw in Kimberley. Yeah. What Ramaphosa had to do was he could not respond to the people of Jan Kemsdorp or the people of, uh, what is this, uh, Pampirstadt mm. uh, as to why their roads look the way it does or why does sewerage come into their houses. Yeah. Because how do, you, how do you respond to say local government is completely and utterly broken? These mm. are the steps that I'm taking to actually fix it because mm. you cannot, there's so many fires to put off. How do you say I'm going to prioritize this? Yeah. So what does Ramaphosa do? He tells the community exactly what they've told him. So you deflect and you mm. say, mm. your streets are a mess. Not, hey, we're going to pump in two million rand mm. to fix all of these roads in Khalashue. Or, you, you, do you understand yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah. Because it's easier to, to, to fixate or, or to just tell people what they want to hear to mm. say, I agree with you. And it's, and it's quite different to the Zuma years of, we have a good story to tell. You know, the, yeah, the, yeah. And that was the narrative. Because they, they could trade off. The, the capital and and some of the growth that had happened in the early part of that, that absolutely period. and you could you i mean you it was not it, it, it the, the breaking of the state was happening during mm. the time now mm. the state is broken yeah but but what what makes me uncomfortable is as a president when you speak to business leaders and when you speak to ordinary community members why is it that you're not taking it a step further and that's mm. what the state of the nation address needs to say you yeah. cannot say that uh, the bureaucracy is in a mess. Our civil servants, it's terrible that so many thousands mm. of, of civil servants do business with the state. Where is the, the kind of, 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 and I hate to use the word radical, mm. um, uh, interventions in that, in that, okay, the law is passed that it's criminalized. You've been announcing, you've been announcing, mm. um, uh, what's this word, lifestyle, lifestyle audits for, for civil servants. It's been two years. You have a whole department of public service and administration. Mm, mm. So, 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 and then, that, so, the, so that's the that's the, the the what what I think needs to happen in the sure. state of the nation address. And I think that another thing that we ignoring, which is absolutely important to keep check on, yeah. is the creation of these para government structures by creating okay. um, SOE councils mm. and investment envoys mm. and and uh, a panel to four IR panel. Yeah. Why do you have government departments staffed mm. with experts, DDGs, director generals, sure. whose job and mandate is to uh, get policy uh, uh, in order mm. and to effect that policy. Mm. But now you're creating independence from out there to 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 reflect, for example, right. on, on 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 the situation. And I'll go back to the state security agency. You had an entire Mufumadi High panel report. They are the same challenges that Mufumadi highlighted mm. is persisting today. So what was the intervention to say I have the Mufumadi report? What can I do? To, to 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 tangibly change mm. and turn around this highly broken, highly political politicized yeah. um, intelligence agency. And that's what's lacking. And I think, I mean, Ramaphosa is effectively halfway through his term. This is the thing. We're so stuck in the, like, we're just starting narrative that it's like, it's two years. It's two years. In fact, I mean, uh, uh, 
by by the end of this year, it's the the, mm. the machinery of who's going to be the next president mm. or Ramaphosa's second yeah. term possibilities is already going to be in place. Can I come to that? Because another interesting chapter in your book is this question of the the fight back. Yeah, you know, there's been a lot of talk that from from the inception of Ramaphosa's presidency, there's been an attempt to sabotage, undermine, and effectively remove President Ramaphosa as soon as possible. Mm. Um, but I think what's really interesting about your chapter is that it's not just based on, you know, th I think this is going to happen. You actually detail meetings that have happened, people who are behind this process. Mm. And so I think you have quite unique insight into that process. Mm. Take us through this fight back chapter and some of the things you discovered even very early on in the Ramaphosa presidency. So, I mean, obviously, the, the way Ramaphosa won Nazarek probably gave rise to this fight back mm. because mm. it was not it was not um, uh, definitive in any way. And so that's why people who, who serve alongside him could have created this effort to undermine him at every single step, yeah. right? And this happens. This happens uh, when, 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 when board chairpersons have to resign. Mm. You, this happens when, when Patabile Lamini is appointed to a board of a state entity. Sure. So, 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 that 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 weakened power that he arrived with is something that's always going to be um, his Achilles heel, mm. and so the, so 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 the fight back uh, context is not it's not uh, what we see on Twitter where Pravin or anti Pravin, you know mm. those kind of you know surface level debates, but it's a reality of people who had benef benefited mm. from an entire system breaking apart that are now uh, threatened by the system being rebuilt. Sure. And by no means am I saying that Ramaphosa is this um, person who's doing it just, uh, you know, this Mandela who's fixing the country mm, and, mm, mm, you know, mm. he's probably fixing the NPA for his own political gain. Sure, or sure. I mean, uh, SARS, for example, people yeah. can argue that he appointed his own person there yeah. the same way Tom Moyani was appointed. And to be fair, I think there is something to be... Ramaphosa has many challenges, but he is doing something very different to the Zuma era. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. He may not be able to fix the patient. I, I have doubted from the yeah, beginning. Yeah, yeah. I was yeah. very much a lone voice in, <laughs> in 2018. In, in, in the celebration of Ramaphoria. Yeah, exactly. But I don't think there's an agenda to fundamentally compromise the state. Necessarily. As was the case. Right. Uh, that doesn't mean that he's going to be able to actually fix the state. You yeah, know? Yeah. So I think we should distinguish while at the same time being critical of the of the outcomes. Absolutely. And the thing is, the the, the, the thing is that's why you can we can clap when you appoint a Mufamad report mm. or a Nugent mm. report, but then we can also criticize you when you don't implement Absolutely. the findings. And you know, this is what we need to start being able to do, right? Because I think it's been very binary, yes. either like angel, devil, devil. Yeah, yeah. And I don't I just don't feel like the ANC ever works when they're being praised and celebrated because they then sit back and they're like, oh yeah. okay. We can oh, for. Also, we under, we underestimate the fact that uh, a lot of the people who serve in the Ramaphosa administration were the same architects mm. of the sure. destruction of the state in the Zuma years. So, sure. so, so sure. that's something that needs to be kept in our head. But, mm. but mm. coming back to yeah. the fight back is that the reality of it is, Ace Mahashule aptly put it, it's just five years, comrades. Mm. We'll be back five years later. Yeah. And when you see the discussions, especially around the state-owned enterprises, mm. and when you see, um, uh, you know, the type of 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 of, of fights and and within the top structures of the ANC, yeah. you understand that the now that five years has become two point five years, mm. and so now there's this this kind of of emboldenedness that we wouldn't have seen maybe in twenty eighteen mm. that mm. you're seeing now to say, oh, your time is almost up. We're coming back for yeah, this. Um, you know, so, someone asked, you know. And this is just random about the the re-emergence of Tuduzani Zuma at at the ANC uh, event in mm. in Kimberley, and I mm. said, I mean, the reality of it is that he can't be there, and he can't because because it it no people have realized that we that the Ramaphosa probably was a lot more talk than action, mm. and so the apprehension maybe of his first two years of oh my God, they may mm. come for me, mm. has become, it's only 2.5 years. I can, if, I, if I fight effectively yeah. for two and a half years, I can then become hmm. uh, this. And, 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 I mean, it's, and it's a serious thing that yeah. people, are, people are underestimating that, that actually this is, this is Ramaphosa's unity project probably is the thing that kicked him 
mm. or, or we'd see it much later mm. that that this unity that, no we need we need everyone on board yeah. we need yeah. to we need to find consensus we need to have seriously compromised people in the executive you know that that kind of um, action mm. is probably what's going to be the unraveling mm. of him mm. um particularly because he he the, the he, he didn't have the luxury of this consensus thing that he likes to to perpetuate sure, sure. particularly because you don't know what you're dealing with mm. you're dealing with people who 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 would want to and again we're not doing this angels and demons mm. situation mm -hmm. but but like when you look at at the conversations around around escom uh, and I'm just using Eskom because that's the most topical thing at the moment yeah. and will probably be the most topical thing in his in his um state of the nation address yeah. that he cannot move on the bundling unbundling of Eskom mm. which is so necessary to to recur to turn things around to 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 take uh, to um the 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 economy um out of risk because literally if Eskom fails the country fails sure. and the economy fails and so 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 I mean you can't do that because of this this mm. sort of Fight back, or this type of of, of uh, maneuvering, because of this 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 weakened political power that you walked in with, mm -hmm. and what happened in the process to that is that while he had the weakened political power, he had the luxury of the optimism of people who wouldn't usually have been optimistic mm. for an ANC president. Mm, absolutely, he squandered that, yeah. and now he's only left with this fight back. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I really hope that you will, you know go and get this book because it's filled with lots of these nuggets and stuff you wouldn't know about how this transition from one era to another happened within the ANC. But to end off, um, I wanted to touch on something a little different, which is being a journalist. You've also spoken a lot about the mental health of journalism and the difficulties of journalism. And I think that you know, in our country, there's a lot of talk about the media. Yeah. And I think part of the reason that the narrative is where it is, is because journalists aren't people. You know? Yeah, yeah, They're people who deliver news, usually bad news, yeah, news yeah. that you don't like. And, and we don't actually see what it's like to be a journalist, to get up early in the morning, to face this criticism, yeah. you know, from all sides. One minute you're someone's best friend, yeah, the yeah. next minute you're their worst enemy. Um, take us through just, you know, why you've been a lot more public about questions of mental health and about showing yeah. how difficult it can be to be a journalist in South Africa today. So I think that, uh, you know, th there's some people who would claim that, you know, we, we sort of just, you know, cry babies when you when you when you bring the issue of, 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 of the importance of, of mental health mm -hmm. and uh, in the space. And, and, and the reality of it is that our predecessors didn't, were not exposed to the level of criticism, the level of trolling, the level of harassment mm. that we are now face because of Twitter and because of social media and because of the, the ease of, of, of communication. Yeah. And the reality of it is that we are, we are forgetting that the harassment is a media freedom issue. It mm. really is a media freedom issue. So, so when people are doxxed online, when people are trolled online, when people are, when, 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 when you know, and, and, and this, I mean, the Bell Pottinger era of 2016-17 mm. um, uh, literally paved way to the normalization of constant harassment of journalists. Absolutely. And so, you know, at a time, you know, you, 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 there, there would be some, uh, some, some outrage because one person was, was intimidated or whatever. Mm. But the reality of it is that the consequences of this is a media freedom consequence. And so when you have whoever the politician is chucking out a journalist or it, mm. it, it gives rise it gives rise to the right the, the unprecedented trolling and unprecedented bots attacking you yeah. and it has a human consequence to the to the where we've seen journalists opting to not write controversial stories mm. to not go ask controversial questions to not uh, um, to not put your neck out because a lot of journalism is putting your neck out sure. because it's easier to cope with the consequences of just being um, you know, he said, she said, journalists, then putting your neck out. Mm. And that has a fundamental consequence on media freedom and, pe and journalists' ability to ask questions that really need to be asked and probe things that really, really need to be probed. And this is across the political spectrum Absolutely. because there's bullying from the DA, there's bullying from the ANC, mm. there's bullying from the EFF, there's sure. bullying from the NGO space mm, as well. Mm. And so the reality of it is... Even other journalists bullying other journalists. Absolutely. And and, and the consequence, and, and why I thought that I'm in a good space to talk about it is because I've been through it. I've mm. come out onto the other side. Mm. And I'm in a space in my, in, in my, in my career where I don't no, no longer have to prove myself. Yeah. So, 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 so use that 
capital, if you will, yeah. to say, no, 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 this needs to stop. We need, and the reality of it is, when you talk about bribing journalists, unethical journalism, all the things people criticize journalism mm. about, mm. this is at the, at the center of, of this type of harassment. Sure. And, and, and these conversations have to be held in tandem. Mm. We need to support journalists so that their journalism is ethical and uh, you know in line with the press code, etc. These things don't happen exclusive of each other. And I think that the error of this this brave journalists and this you know this kind of Jesus syndrome that mm. journalists had, I think it needs to come to an end because the <laughs> time has changed. Mm. And the reality of it is that we will not be able to pull off um, uh, Gupta leaks mm. and because because the generation that has come after me ha is being is being not supported in the way that we ought yeah. to be, support each other. And, and that's something I think that that um, is going to be my focus maybe for the next while mm. to say as much as as much as ex journalist is 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 courageous in and, and we support the questions that he asks, um, you know, Praveen Gordon in a press conference. Sure. We also need to support this person to say, how are you feeling? Are you OK mm. when mm. he's attacked? And when, I mean, you, you are subject to, to levels sure, of criticism. Sure. It does have a personal impact. Of course. And, and it becomes more and more, the, the you know, the, the longer you're out in mm. the field, the longer you, 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 prov you know, you, 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 you do what you do. And the reality of it is that more journalists mm. are, are, are deciding to turn away from that type yeah. of journalism, yeah. which is a bigger problem for us. Um, and, and if you criticize the quality of journalism, you have to talk about mental health of journalists. Well, we thank you for the many we can, times. We can continue forever. Oh, well, well, I, I, we're here. I mean, you can just come I'll in. I'll be back. Come in every day. We have a standing <laughs> slot. Cool. No, thanks so much. And we thank you for continuing to stick your neck out thank for you. the great journalistic work you've done in our country and for this great book. Make sure you get it, Balance of Power by Carnita Hunter. And um, thanks so much for joining us on SMWX. Thank you. You guys are doing great work. Aye, aye, aye. Thanks for watching the content. Like, share, and subscribe on all platforms. SMWX.co.za to join the WhatsApp channel. And let's build a new conversation for a new generation. Aye, aye.